at the beginning, I would like to thank you all for coming. And uh, I would like to say s just several words in Polish concerning uh, next uh, meetings. Uh, no więc uh, nasze następne spotkanie nie jest jeszcze um, jakby zdefiniowane w pełni uh, i otrzymają Państwo informacje mailowe na ten temat i również informacje mailowe będą dotyczyć, ponieważ otrzymaliśmy um, jakby kontakt z od osoby, która występowała poprzednio, czyli od przewodniczącego Dory, dotyczący, no, można powiedzieć, pewnego otwarcia ze strony Dory na to, czy prośby rozważenia przez polskie instytucje możliwości przystąpienia do sieci. Także na te tematy dostaną Państwo informacje e, przez maila. Ok, and uh, now we would like to welcome um, profesor Yuli Tamir from Israel. Uh, Professor Tamir uh, is uh, a director of the president of uh, Beit Barrel College and she was also minister of education uh, in Israel. Uh, she's an author of several very interesting books. I looked into those and uh, uh, it's Hello. Okay. And we have some. All right. Um, uh, and today she will be speaking about the situation of uh, universities in Israel. So um, I would like to. I would like to start. So, um, Professor, could you start your uh, presentation? Yes, uh, good evening, and uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to speak with you. Um, I think today the situation in Israel is uh, very volatile. And the situation of uh, the universities reflect the general instability, um, tension, trauma, post-trauma that uh, the Israeli public, both Israelis and Palestinians, uh, is uh, going through. So I'd like to share with you a little bit what happens in my college. My college uh, has both Israelis, Arab and Israeli Jews. We are uh, the largest teaching uh, training college in Israel. And um, we sit in the middle of Israel. So we have neighboring towns that are Jewish and neighboring towns that are Arab. So we're really uh, sort of a microcosmos of the society in Israel. And in this respect, I think we are challenged every day to keep a working community that is able to work together despite the terrible situation right now. Um, when uh, the atrocities of the 7th of October happened, uh, it was clear to all of us in our college that this is a real threat to our joint community. And uh, we have been working really for many, many years to create uh, a sense of coexistence in our college. We have, my vice chancellor is a Arab, my, a lot of my faculty are Arab, many of my students are Arab. We worked very hard to keep the community together. And we have also, we have uh, ultra Orthodox Jews, religious Jews, secular Jews from North and South, really from every part of the country. And we realized that uh, I think the, the most tragic aspect of the situation right now is that we are caught in really a sort of a vicious circle that just intensifies violence, uh, both externally and inward. Oh, okay. Um, so um, um, what happened in the 7th of October? 
was intentional. The atrocities were not coincidental. They were meant uh, not only to hurt and humiliate and uh, bring about personal pain to the people who were victims of this attack, they were meant to draw Israel into Gaza. And now the people of Gaza are suffering a lot. The children of Gaza are suffering a lot. I think it breaks my heart to see what happens there, but it also breaks my heart to know that more than 140 Israelis are still kept uh, hostage in Gaza, and we even cannot get their names or their identities. So there is a great uncertainty. Can you, you can think how many of your mothers and fathers, if you have a, a daughter kept in Gaza with all the abuse we are hearing about, it's really uh, a torture for all the, the, the Israeli society takes it, I think, very, very personally, every person that is kept in Gaza now. For us in the college, we have invested a lot of energy in order to keep the system going because we serve the education system. And I think now in Israel, nothing is more necessary than to keep a working education system. For the children that are, a lot of the children have been evacuated from their homes. A lot of children are post-traumatic and they need their system working. So we started teaching very early. We started teaching in the beginning of December, unlike many other higher education institutions. And we started by working, not in our usual um, frameworks, but in the um, hotels with the evacuees. And we really uh, learned there about the importance, and I think you also know it from your own national his, uh, history, how important it is in time of crisis uh, to protect children. And they are mostly, I think, vulnerable and suffer from moving around, losing their homes, their school, their schoolmates, their instability. So I fear that both in Israel and in the Palestinian side, we will see a generation of children that are suffering trauma. And again, I think this is something that is not, uh, uh, that, that, that you're aware of because you've gone through terrible wars as well. Um, I think for us as educators, our main investment now is in building uh, a way of dialogue that is protecting people rather than inciting them. And it's very difficult. Uh, our government, you have managed to change your government, I envy you, but our government is still very extreme. Uh, our minister of um, internal security, ironically, is the most extreme member of our government. And there is a lot of pressure to create or to steer um, instability and violence in Israel, not only where the war happens in Gaza and now also unfortunately in Lebanon. So we find ourselves, people like myself who are part of the peace camp and who want coexistence, we are now um, fighting in two fronts. One is the internal one, I have uh, the Minister of Education in Israel uh, really uh, doing his best to uh, force me to resign. And people uh, are uh, from the right are day after day trying to steer um, uh, sort of uh, within our campus to steer a fight, internal fight. So uh, we will lose control over things here. Uh, and at the same time, we have to relate and protect and uh, give uh, our support to our students. Many of them are fighting in the South and in the North. Many of them lost family members. Uh, my um, Jewish students are, many of them have been evacuated, uh, removed from their places and they are, um, facing great troubles to go back to some kind of a normal life. And my Arab students are very much afraid of what will happen to them. Though one should say, and this is, I think, quite remarkable, that despite the tragedy here and in Gaza, 
the Arab situation, the Arab citizens, the Palestinian citizens of Israel have been extremely cooperative and unwilling to uh, steer a fight, even though the minister is trying to create uh, some sort of, a, or constantly creating clashes with the Arab community. They, I think they understand the manipulation and they are very careful not uh, to go there. So it's all very, um, uh, I think, stressful right now. Uh, nevertheless, um, both my college and other universities are working now uh, almost as usual. Uh, we do uh, provide support for uh, soldiers on reserve duty. They didn't come back yet. And I could say, I think in general, most universities in Israel and colleges have a more liberal view than the government and are therefore seen as part of the sort of uh, elites that are uh, fighting against both the erosion of democracy in Israel, something that the war stopped uh, because uh, this government couldn't fight into different fronts. So they, what they call the juridical reform, they have stopped it. I don't know if they will renew it after the war. <clears throat> so the universities are seen actually as uh, part of the opposition, even though universities are not um, publicly uh, affiliated with any political view or party, it is quite clear that most of the university presidents and head of colleges are very much uh, for uh, changing this government and against both the, as I said, the erosion of democracy and the, and the attempt to undermine the coexistence on campuses. Um, still, we have very little, I should say, involvement in what we teach. The government is reluctant to uh, intervene in academic freedom. I think this is something that is uh, quite unique to this kind of totalitarianism that has been developed in Israel. Uh, it's a very uh, shallow totalitarianism. It doesn't try to shape the way people uh, teach or think. Um, it's its propaganda is very much on the surface, in the television, on the internet, but it does not try to change uh, the way universities work. It does try with little success yet to change what we teach in schools. So for us as a teacher training college, you know, this is a, a an important issue because we want our teachers to be protected and teachers are, I don't know how it was in Poland, I'm very interested to know, they are very much under threat if they touch controversial issues. So it's not so much that people are told what to say, but people are silenced. They can't criticize the government, they can't criticize the situation, they certainly cannot criticize what is happening in Gaza, and everybody is expected to uh, follow the main line. Uh, and there are very high sort of public penalties if you don't. So um, it's not like we have uh, somebody dictating what to say. It's more somebody instructing us what not to say. And as you know, this is a very effective way of preventing people from uh, objecting uh, to uh, things done by the government or things done by the ministries both of education, the Ministry of uh, uh, Interior Affairs, and so on. For uh, the, the uh, universities in Israel, uh, I think the, the great fear is that uh, the minister who is very extreme will try at some point to intervene in either nominations of heads of universities and colleges, uh, he is certainly trying to intervene in the nomination of the Higher Education Council, which is in, uh, in Israel supposed to be a totally independent uh, body, and that there will be um, 
even greater intervention in our internal affairs. For example, just uh, when the war erupted, we all got uh, letters from all the heads of the universities, uh, got letters from the Minister of Education asking us to report on students who are supporting the Hamas. And actually it was meant to uh, see, to, to prove our loyalty by telling on people that they have uh, probably mostly Arab students, they have been writing uh, things against Israel. And I should, I think most universities, certainly we did not uh, cooperate with this intention. We have not responded to it. And we tried very much not to um, uh, create a, a situation where students in the universities are afraid to speak. And at, at least uh, in our college, there were only two very extreme cases that were brought to some sort of a public discussion. And uh, we wrote, and I think uh, other universities are now uh, following it, we wrote an ethical code of what could and could not be said on campus. Um, we thought it was very important for the protection of uh, free speech. Our code allows people, obviously, to uh, criticize the government. Uh, it allows people to support the idea of a Palestinian state, because many of our students, as I said, are Palestinian Arabs. It does not allow uh, pe to people publicly support the Hamas or uh, what happened on the 7th of October. So we try to find a place between, you know, um, I think an obvious and humanistic uh, sort of uh, uh, deliberation about human rights and national rights. We also try to uh, exclude the extremes and not to allow them to play a role in the game. It's not always simple uh, because the extreme get more, as you know, the extremes get more attention than those who are in the middle. And they are certainly more uh, active and trying all the time to pull the, the debate to the extreme, helped by the government, but also helped by the opposition. As you know now, um, the, the biggest problem is that there is no common language. I'm sure it was also the situation in Poland. The government has one narrative, the opposition has another narrative. And uh, most people even consume their information through uh, channels that are affiliated with one narrative or another. So the division, the polarization within the society, and therefore also the polarization between uh, students and colleges is growing. I think that uh, this is a big, big problem for universities who wanted, uh, I think for, traditionally, to just allow people to search for knowledge. They had a very naive assumption that there is something called knowledge that could be found if you search for it. But now I think people find what they want to, or what they search for. And they, it just reinforced their views. And I think my uh, difficulty as an educator, and I would love to hear what your opinion is, is that our greatest uh, difficulty right now is to take people out of their own bubble, whether it's the right bubble or the wrong bubble, just in order to have some conversation with people who are different than themselves, without immediately erupting into extreme uh, struggles. And this is, uh, I think, becoming a worldwide phenomena, and it's really um, raising questions about the role of universities, so or higher education or education maybe in general. Um, unlike the American universities, we took a stand, as I said, um, that left, I think, enough of a, a freedom of opinion, but also set some limits. Um, and we are very clear that the limits is not set for us from the outside, from the government, but these are internal limits. It came out of a dialogue within our own community it is a product of our uh, listening to each other and at the end of the day coming up with some framework of discourse uh, within uh, our college. And I, um, I think that the last few months have challenged us on the most uh, sensitive points, but it's not over yet. It's obviously going, I think, to get 
uh, more difficult because the political struggle is now going, I think, to be intensified. Nobody knows where the next when the next election would be. It is quite clear that it is within uh, Netanyahu's interest to uh, continue the struggle and the war because the moment the war will be over or declared, even posed, there will be uh, a call for immediate elections. So now um, we feel that we are uh, kept in a war situation for very personal reasons of the prime minister. I personally believe that if there was a desire to move ahead, uh, the American proposal, uh, President Biden is very active in our region. We could have moved a little bit further and certainly faster. And I, like many of my colleagues and many people in Israel, I'm very worried about what will happen to the people who are kidnapped, who are kidnapped. They are held in unbearable conditions. We hear a lot about uh, sexual abuse of women and men. We don't know uh, a lot about their situation right now. And um, I think the human interest is to stop the, the war now and bring the hostage out. But certainly this is the view of the opposition and not uh, the government. So um, the situation now is that our immediate struggle is to um, stop the war and bring our people back and stop the salvation in Gaza and then change the government. We have a lot to learn from you because you have succeeded. And um, I hope uh, that one day we will succeed too. So this is like just uh, some opening remarks and I will be happy to answer your questions or um, learn from you what happened in Poland and how we can um, help each other. All right, I'm sorry for the sounds. Uh, if you want to, uh, you know, ask some questions or if you have some comments, please use the raise hand option. Okay, Algird, please speak. Thank you for your time and thank you for sharing your deep experiences inside the Israel situation. We are sympathetic with you and we are trying to do best to help you. And especially that our country has some common history and, and the conflict and fighting totalitarianism. And I think we should gather and find the greatest uh, answers to the to the all the threats, both institutionalized and then the particular like, like aggression and like government who acts against their own country. But the question I'm going to ask you is how you resist that the, the government of Netanyahu got to university community. The, you, you said, as if, if I uh, correct, uh, remember it correctly, that you resist the, the pressure and that Netanyahu failed to have a pressure over the program and how and what to learn. Thank you. Thank you. So first of all, the, we all uh, participated in the very vast demonstrations that were held in Israel before the war. And I think these demonstrations were very significant. They were enormous demonstrations. They went on for months and months and they kept uh, public attention uh, alert so that the, the the changes, the legal changes the government wanted to pass were not uh, passed in the parliament. Um, we also, I think the universities were very active in providing uh, support materials, uh, alternative legislation uh, to the people in the parliament who are supporting our views. So we were like uh, producing both uh, comparison, international comparison, uh, showing people how we are, you know, um, following the road of totalitarianism that have been sort of followed in other countries and where it can lead. We've uh, showed a lot of uh, um, support to the uh, legal legal expert worked with the MKs, and the people were just in the streets. And I think this was extremely effective from the point of view of not allowing the situation to uh, deteriorate. 
what we fail to do is to bring about an election. And Netanyahu seems to be sort of immune to public criticism from all kinds. I mean, now there is a, a, a report on an on a utterly different matter three years ago. There was a big event, um, a celebratory event of ultra-Orthodox Jews and Netanyahu just neglected the security uh, consideration there and gave in to the ultra-Orthodox like he does in many other uh, spheres. And the result was a massive killing of innocent people because the place collapsed because of it was too crowded. So the, the, the committee, the investigation committee said he is responsible for not paying attention. He knew that it was dangerous. He wasn't stopping it. But he like brushes it off and goes on. So this is our failure that people now take it for granted that he's not okay, that he's actually very much uh, concerned with his own private things. There is there are four trials against him. There is community uh, uh, investigations against him. And somehow we fail to bring about an election that's obviously very, very frustrating, but um, we'll keep trying. Thank you. Okay, so next we have, oh, Mr. Dean, but unfortunately I don't have your name, sir. So please speak. Panzikania? Mm. Sorry, it's, it's, it was about me. Yes, I, I don't know why, why it is here, this label. Anyway, Tomasz Kozlowski, yes, thanks a lot for your great uh, lecture and so, let's say, passionate and full of emotions. But I do understand that it is uh, really the very situation that it is impossible to, to talk about it in a different way. Uh, to, you mentioned about this uh, relation between knowledge and opinions. I think there is more or less everywhere in the world nowadays. There is a real huge problem, especially probably in humanities. But uh, but uh, uh, I do think that not uh, not uh, only uh, two two one question. But okay, I mean, two questions, if I uh, can say so. The first one is uh, the situation that you've just described related to all kinds of things, social things. I mean, religious, political, social, traditional, history, historical, and so on. Uh, in your opinion, what do you think, uh, uh, to, to what extent the religious problems, tensions are, let's say, on a great level, or maybe different ones like national and, and so on? And second point, uh, a general one, because uh, here in, in within this seminar we are trying to discuss the the, the models of, of 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 present and the future universities and, and so on. Uh, from from your point of view, uh, what do you think? Uh, what was or is obviously what is the the most let's say powerful point within Israel higher education? I mean, what was your let's say the biggest achievement? And uh, no, okay, perhaps you, but you got the point. Okay, thanks. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, as for the religious issue, obviously, we are moving unfortunately from a political conflict to a religious conflict. And it's uh, obviously making things worse. Uh, in politics, you can compromise. Uh, people understand actually that uh, they are not going to get everything they wish for. But in the religious conflict, people are ready to do terrible things to each other because they think this is sort of God's command or this is what they are uh, supposed to do to um, satisfy their beliefs. Um, and that, I think, is part of what we've seen on the 7th of October. I think that the, the people who were doing the massacre and the terrible uh, things were motivated by na this really brutal and toxic combination between nationalism and religion. You know, doing the jihad thing and believing that if they do it and even if they die, they will go straight to heaven. And unfortunately, on the Jewish side, there is... A, really great um, 
I think, uh, spread of Jewish fundamentalism. And both are terrible from my point of view because they don't leave a place for the other. They, they are, the Jews say that the, the fundamentalist messianic a Jewish uh, view is that uh, we somehow God will save us and we will have the whole of the land of Israel and the Palestinians will vanish. And the, the Palestinian fundamentalist view, I'm simplifying it obviously, is that they should kill all the Jews because that's part of the jihad for God. And these two camps are not going to settle the issue in any positive way. So every each of the societies is now also fighting against its own fundamentalists. Because unless we fight as Jews against our own fundamentalists, unless the Muslims fight against their own fundamentalists, we will live in an endless clash. And, um, you know, unfortunately, neither Islam nor Judaism went through a, a period of uh, some sort of uh, um, I would say toleration or moderation, like a lot of the Christian world. And we are in this very raw situation where people are really ready to kill for what they think is their, um, you know, is their uh, religious and um, um, messianic sort of uh, belief. And, and, and that's a, one of the tragedies uh, uh, that uh, that we are facing here. And I don't think it's going to go away now. You know, the Ramadan is starting. The Ramadan is the months of uh, uh, prayers of, of the Muslims. Uh, and um, Itamar Benkvir, our Minister of Inter uh, Internal Security, is actually doing his best to create uh, more and more rights during the Ramadan. The Ramadan is a very sensitive period because people are religiously very motivated and he's actually trying to sort of uh, escalate the, the tension like saying less people would be able to pray in Mount Temple which is one of the commands of the Ramadan less people can come to public places so um, we are facing a very uh, difficult months uh, ahead of us um, as for the universities and, and, and the moral stand of the universities and the role of the universities, I think this is, a, a, I think, first of all, as you said, it's a global issue and it's a, it's a I think we reached a point that uh, we, we need to uh, reevaluate the role of higher education. My own view, and it's certainly not the representative of anyone else, is that um, we should withdraw from I don't know, by the way, if this was the historical role of universities. I think universities were at their best when they saved either the country, the nation, or some great ideas. But I think we cannot be neutral. And I think universities should be very clear that they have an agenda and that they have a, a humanistic democratic agenda. And it's great to be an engineer or a scientist or whatever, or a doctor, but first of all, you have to be a human being and a good citizen. And I think this is where Israel at its greatest produced great doctors and great scientists and great, uh, and, you know, uh, people who do research and do uh, build starts up. It didn't do so well in building um, decent democratic uh, citizens. And I think this is a big failure, not only of Israel, but of the West. And I think we're seeing it everywhere. And it's time for us not to be neutral. It's time for us to be active because the other side is not neutral. We are neutral and they lose and they're active and they win. So my lesson is join the winning strategy, not the winning party and start fighting for abuse and let other people be neutral. <laughs> Okay, Mr. Professor Klich, please. Thank you. Two issues, if you please. The first one is uh, of rather general nature, uh, but the second one is uh, uh, quite uh, n n n narrowly focused. Uh, as to the more general one, uh, I see that uh, uh, polarization 
is a common feature in Israel and in Poland. So coping with polarization is a very demanding task. So exchange of uh, our experience with the most effective ways of uh, countervailing uh, polarization could be of some uh, benefits for all of us. Uh, having said that, I would like to uh, ask you about the way uh, you uh, are trying to address the issue of polarization at your college. Uh, as far as I know, your college is uh, very international in, in, in both in respect to the staff and the students. You said that uh, uh, yeah. there are the, the whole mosaic of students at your college. So the question, how do you uh, 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 deal with uh, this social coherence? How do you, what do you do uh, in order to uh, maintain uh, this uh, 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 moral, not, not, not only moral, but uh, understanding and uh, mutual re uh, respect uh, at your uh, college? This is the general question. And now the more specific, uh, as far as I know, uh, you are uh, known in Israel uh, because of the innovative methods you are using um, in the day-to-day -day operation. Uh, and I know that uh, you are especially proud of uh, on-the-job training methods. So mm -hmm. uh, further comments uh, on this would be very appreciated. And at the end, I must uh, remind uh, all of my colleagues here that uh, Beit Bell College uh, is a very important institution on the educational uh, n n n market in Israel. As far as I know, one out of every five teachers is a n n n Beit Bell College uh, graduate. So it is very, very important how your college addressed these issues of polarization because this is a kind of a lecture for uh, all the uh, n n community, not only Israeli community, I, I must admit. Thank you. Thank you. Well, the question of polarization is really difficult. Um, and as I said, it's because we find less and less spaces for dialogue. And um, people live, uh, it's not only in Israel, I've seen now um, data from the United States, from um, uh, from Europe. It, in the United States, it's quite astonishing. People are more likely to support marriage between a, a black and a white person, which was quite uh, controversial in the past then from a Republican and, then, and a Democrat. So the political polarization became the main divide. And I think it's true in other countries. And partly it's the, because the politics today works on negation. It's not about, I have my views and I want to share them with you and tell you what is important in my view and let's see what you can take out of it. It's like saying that you are illegitimate. I don't want to speak with you. I don't want to be near you. Certainly not marry anyone like you. So this is uh, the way I define myself. I think the self-definition of people now is more negative than positive. And I think the biggest struggle now is to go back to a situation where people define their own identity, ideological identity, positively. Because if I say to you, I think that, you know, the best thing to do is, I don't know, create more social justice and a welfare state. And you say, no, I think free market, we can converse. But if I say, oh, you're a capitalist pig and you are just, so there's no conversation. And that's what happens. We don't have a conversation, really. We just uh, throw insults from one side to the other. And we think the other are either stupid or deaf or whatever, and we don't have a conversation. And um, I think this is a, I don't know, I don't have a, if I had a solution for that, I would uh, be very um, yeah, delighted to share it with you, but I'm not sure I have it, but I think we should at least put it on the table. Sometimes when you um, 
just reflect it to people in a dialogue. You're not saying anything but saying, you know, because I'm a woman and because I am a, a known as on my sort of left wing pro Palestinian fluids, a lot of people just, you know, have a curse. And I say, okay, what does it mean? What what do you offer? Okay, maybe I'm just crazy. Maybe you know other more uh, brutal uh, expressions. But what does it mean? Okay, where we go from here? Let's say something positive. And people find it very difficult to say something positive. So uh, I think it's a, for us as intellectual, it's a big uh, big challenge. Now about the training, we are very proud of our uh, training uh, system. Though I think even though it's very good, it could be better because the world moves so fast and teacher training is not uh, able to to follow the, the uh, I think the pace of the changing world around us, which is something that uh, we all uh, realize. But we do, uh, do a lot of field work and we learn a lot from the field. I mean, I think in the last few years, our position is that great things happen in the field and they're not necessarily motivated by research. They are motivated by experience. And we are trying to see how we can learn from this experience and make our students more eager to try new things, to be more like a, have a start, the startup tradition in Israel to adopt it. And it doesn't mean that you have to wait until, you know, you've proven that some theory of education is right because this will take you 20 years and by then, everything will change 19 times. Uh, but you have to try like, um, be more experimental, more daring, and try and do something that follow your heart and your values in you, in what you do. And I see the places where people are convinced to do it. First of all, they're more happy. They are more, they feel more empowered. This is something they want to do. They don't wait for instruction. They do it because they think it's important or they like it or um, it's part of their um, message to their, st their students. And um, they're more effective. So for me, this is the big change we're going to. And um, we try to tell to our teachers, and it's very difficult because still uh, the, the education is quite traditional here. Don't follow the curricula, follow two things, your heart and listen to the students because they are there because they are obliged to be there. Poor things, you know, we have uh, forced children to go to school. This is, by the way, our biggest problem. If we had to convince children to go to school, we would have changed schooling long ago. But the first, the, 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 the something that we thought was very good that the education is uh, obligatory made us very lazy. Because I see what people who want to sell things to children, they work very hard, but we are, you know, they come to school and they're there. So uh, this is easy. And um, and I think we try to work like uh, children are not uh, forced to come to our schools, but like we have to convince them that coming to school is worthwhile for them. And it's not easy at all because children are very much critical of what we, t we teach them. And sometimes, right, I, I always give this example because I thought it was, it moved something within me. I have my grandson, uh, went started going to school and they you know like in every country that you paint the letters in and he said to me grandma why do I do this I said well Eli you have to write he says no I will never write I will either dictate or type I'm not gonna write and then I realized I don't write at all I never write anything I I, I either type or record and I suddenly said well this he's gonna sit now two years in school drawing letters and he understands already that this is useless. He won't do it. He's going to be, you know, and then he's going to be identified as a problematic child because he doesn't want to do this. He's, he thinks it's useless. And you say, oh, could it be that the children will not know how to write? You know, maybe. You know, it's frightening, but maybe. Maybe children will, will, will not know how to look at the map because we all use Waze or Google Earth or whatever. Uh, but we impose on them what we think is very important and they rebel. And I think sometimes they are actually, um, they see the future better than we do and uh, we fail to allow them to move ahead. Okay, type, you can type. 
do it. You can translate, do it. They will do it anyhow. So we're just, be, we are becoming a hurdle. Just that instead of helping them, we stop them. And they're very irritated. And I sometimes identify with them. Okay, thank you. Do we have some? Okay. Uh, Professor Giza, please. Uh, thank you very much for what you have said, because it's uh, clear that you have followed your heart. <laughs> and it was uh, very, how to say it, refreshing to listen to, to, to you, really. Thank you so much. I have two, again, I am afraid, quite general uh, remarks or questions. First of all, indeed, the polarization is something that uh, uh, spread uh, over the world. yeah. So we can see everywhere in Europe, also in the United States, that this kind of uh, losing the common ground to dialogue is happening. Uh, the question that I ask myself very often is, do we understand why it happens? Because only understanding why and how it happens, we may, fi may find some solutions. Of course, the obvious answer is that the polarization is fueled by uh, various uh, uh, social actors, like, for example, politicians, to be sure. In Poland, this is for, this is for sure the, 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 the case. Because polarization, like war for Netanyahu, uh, is uh, something that helps them to reach their goals. Yeah? Uh, so I really ask myself the question, why people are so easy to be manipulated and whether in the education that we offer to our children and young people and so on, uh, whether we give them the tools to stay autonomous and to go for their own values. Uh, of course, I, I do not expect that you have the, the answer to this question, but I think that the key task for the universities, uh, for us, would be to try to find out what we can really do, and this we can do only after only understanding why it goes like, I don't know, like the fire in the very dry forests. Okay, and the, my second uh, point is uh, that uh, people are aware that we university people, that we have lost uh, our way, so to say, uh, that we have been uh, manipulated into the situation of massification, but also this gospel of providing labor market with competent people and so on and so on. We have allowed, so to say, to push out humanities from education, not only from the, from the primary or secondary education, but also from the universities, uh, which of course uh, blocks and does not, uh, uh, how to say it, uh, because humanities is about empathy, it's about uh, being open to alternative worlds, worlds and so on and so on. Uh, uh, we have made a few years ago the small qualitative research or other workshops with various people. I should use most probably the word stakeholders because in our managerial uh, world uh, this would be more proper. But anyway, we were talking about how they feel about universities. And you know, the amazing thing was that the first half of the workshop uh, was uh, them uh, attacking universities. You know, there is such a disappointment with universities in the so-called uh, general population. You know, I remember the, the, the guy saying, uh, 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 you, you, do not, you do not even protest. So the modest nurses were able to build a special... Uh, tent town uh, to the opposite uh, side of the uh, prime minister to protest against something. And you are talking about values all the time, but what, but what have you done? 
to mm. defend those values. Uh, we do not hear our voice. And I remember another guy, so they are angry with us. This is what I try to say. And because they are angry with us, they do not want to listen to us and they go for these, you know, populist narrations. Uh, I am not sure that we are able even to communicate with people because we are so wise and we use so many words that are uh, not used by, uh, by, by, by normal people, so to say. That it, so, so basically, we have lost our axionormative basis. And we, and of course, we, uh, 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 sorry, I, I wanted to quote another uh, person who, who told, because we were asking, so what you ex expect universities to do? And somebody said to defend and promote reason. Hmm. You see? So this is uh, what people expect from us. And they are so angry because they are disappointed. Uh, my question is because uh, I don't know how it's uh, in your country, but uh, here in Poland, we are really absolutely trapped in bureaucracy. Uh, I, I have to prepare syllabus uh, showing the effect of education in, uh, you know, using numbers that were prepared somewhere in European Union. And then my students look into the syllabus and say, you see, uh, I do not feel like uh, uh, like like you have taught us uh, the uh, knowledge item number 17 uh -huh. <laughs> you see i mean it's it's awful i hate this and my students hate this but in a sense we do not dare to behave differently you see Yes. And I don't know why because uh, yeah so uh, sorry for being so um uh, uh, so so long, but uh, I feel that we first have to look into the mirror. I agree. First mm -hmm. of all, I agree we have uh, to look into the mirror because uh, we have, I think, to reflect on what we think and what we do as educators. Uh, that That's certainly uh, an important thing for us to do. Um, wh why did it happen? There are many answers. I, I'll give. I'll try one that is not very uh, common. I think the death of the nation state made education uh, contextless. The the context the the nation state uh, gave university a purpose and a context. And once the nation state started fading away, and individualism sort of took the center place in the university um, education, then it's not only capitalism. It's about really, there is uh, laziness also on our part to think about the common good. So if there's no common good and there is no great ideas that lead us to this common good, then uh, what happens is that uh, we just go each each our own way. And that, that I think where we started about polarization, it's not that we have a purpose together to do something. We just go this way or that way. And this is not something that is strong enough to hold us. Now, the nation state with its humanities could talk it like Nazi Germany. You know, the, the Nazis were very good at humanities. They listened to Beethoven and they read Heine and, and then they, they were very, civilized in a way, culturalized. But the the values of the nature state, the nation state were horrific. Or you can have nation state that, you know, develop solidarity and develop a um, sense of responsibility. So really, I think that uh, we lack the desire to work together. And this is something that uh, makes polarization so uh, common because nobody is actually saying, you know, let's do something together. Now with the war, there's a big struggle here. And uh, actually it's happening while we're talking. Everybody, everywhere in Israel, it says we'll win together. 
And I didn't want to write it in my college because I don't believe it's about winning. I think it's about growing out of the situation together. Okay, we'll win. And what then? We can fall apart. We will, is, is our only cause winning? We win for something, not for, you know, just for winning. And it's difficult to bring people into this conversation. It's really difficult these days. So unfortunately, I think this is where we are. Okay, thank you. So, all right, Professor Brickler, please. Well, uh, Professor Tamir, in the first place, thank you for your very touching <clears throat> presentation and talk. I have to tell you, we are in Poland full of full of compassion for what happens in in Israel, and uh, we are following the situation practically every day in our in our media and in our television. Uh, I would like to ask you a question, uh, which is associated to one of the main concerns, not the only one, but one of the main concerns of uh, the community of this seminar. And this uh, <clears throat> concern is about research assessment. Uh, a week ago, exactly a week ago, we, are, we were hosting here uh, uh, Professor Zen Volkes, who is program director of DORA. DORA is a declaration of research assessment and international organization who is uh, trying to um, offer or suggest new ways uh, of assessment different from algorithmic assessment, assessment uh, by uh, numeric uh, <clears throat> measures. And uh, we in this seminar, we are, we are uh, deeply convinced that uh, the, today's research assessment, at least this one that is in Poland, common in Poland and also common in many European and American universities, uh, is degradating scientific life and, uh, and research and researchers and research institutes. So my question is about what is the, uh, what are the methods that uh, uh, you apply, uh, maybe not commonly, but uh, whether you have some experiments at the universities and Israeli universities about a different ways of research assessment? Um, it's a great question. No, we don't. And I think we're in the same trap as you are. I, I, I think that a lot of our researchers um, are working to comply with the regulation. So, you know, if you want to publish in a Q1, Q2 uh, journal, then you have to do A, Y, D, you have to follow this, you have to do citations. And, oh, if I don't, sorry, somebody <laughs> came in tomorrow, it's late here. I'm not at the sorry, for just, okay, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> okay. I didn't think there's anyone around and suddenly he walked in. Um, so, um, yeah, we are trapped in the same, uh, I think, circle of, uh, in order to excel, actually, you have to become very uh, conventional, and very, um, you know, um, not, not, do not dare to do something new, do not dare to do something interdisciplinary because where would you publish it? Uh, and, and I think we are uh, uh, somehow um, sort of uh, reducing the courage of young researchers to do something really br breaking to and innovative because of the way we are uh, evaluating research, but we don't have another we do the same thing as you do, and um, we dislike it as much as you do. Okay, thank you. So I don't see uh, other questions. Maybe, uh, maybe I could ask a question or two because uh, I actually find it very interesting. You said that you think that universities should take aside you know and i i'm 
into history of universities, into you know management of universities. This is my discipline, so to speak. And when I look at the history of universities, I think that you know each time universities were really put to the test, they failed. You know because it's like in Nazi Germany, but I also see it on a smaller scale in Poland when the populists were in power. Uh, we just are not that strong against, you know, the nation states. That's what I'm thinking. But then the nation state, the politicians have uh, are not very long term compared to universities. So I think universities are thinking or we are thinking, all right, we'll, you know, comply for now, but we'll survive this because they're not long term. We are. We will be here for in a hundred years or two hundred, and everything will be kind of okay. So I don't know if it's you know if it's justified this way of thinking, but I I think when universities try to you know take a side, like in U.S. at the moment, you know the universities are very liberal, and they're becoming a target very quickly. So that's one thing. The other thing, uh, very in interesting, I, I think, because we have, and we're not thinking about it very much, we also have a lot of displaced students in Poland at the moment uh, uh, with, you know, lives touched by war and PTSD, etc. Uh, the people from Ukraine, because about mm -hmm. one and a half million people came here. I don't know how much at the moment, maybe a million left. And most of them, uh, women, children, etc. So we have probably about 300, I, I don't really know at the moment, but a lot of students because I think nobody knows. And uh, it's, you know, it's uh, horrific up to a point because we have all those children, you know, and young people in the system. And I think nobody really thinks about them that much, you know, about their experience, about their uh trauma and about what to do with them because the war might not end in a year two five they might never return to their country so i think it's a a different but on some level quite similar situation to to the one you're experiencing mm -hmm. and i don't know if it's a question because of uh, or it's a comment but all right thank you so, so I'll start with the second question. I think I've been before being a Minister of Education as Minister of Immigration here. And I think thinking about support for students uh, who immigrate or emigrate or uh, just are moved to your territory is extremely important. And I think we this is something we can certainly share because we built a very effective support system for students in distress. And I think this is part of my role as a head of the college is to take care of also the mental situation of my students. And if you would like, if those of you who are interested in that, uh, we can, uh, you know, maybe reconvene and talk about it uh, because it's very important. And uh, students, young people in the world are now facing a very uh, extreme emotional states of mind. And I think we should be thinking about it. And it's not unrelated to extremism and what we have been talking about earlier. As for universities taking a stand, I think that, always, I mean, taking a stand is dangerous because you can take the wrong stand that I said earlier about the nation state in Nazi Germany. Mm -hmm. But I think the situation right now is that the people who are taking a stand are those who are extreme and are mostly on the more belligerent extreme right. They are not afraid. It's like, look about the, Trump and Biden are an example, okay? The people who are extreme take a stand, they believe mm -hmm. they're right and they say it. And we are neutral. So for me, yes, I know that if we take a stand, some people will take an opposite stand. But at least I will have a stand. Mm -hmm. I, I want to, I, I was asked earlier, I want the students coming out of my college, I want to be sure they at least heard a different voice. And that's the most I can do. I can't prevent other people from having other opinions. 
And maybe, the, you know, if we all lose the democratic fight, everybody will go to um, totalitarian fascist universities who are adoring one person. And then we really love, it's not about the universities anymore. It's about the future and our lives and our, you know, and our social theory. Uh, but we're not fighting. I, well, I, I'm, you know, I'm a street person. I started my life as an activist and I'm still an activist, even though I'm a university uh, president. I'm an activist in my nature and it, it causes a lot of problems for me and for my college, but I always believe activism is better than being silent. Okay, thank you very much. All right, do we have some questions? Okay. Uh, so, Professor Kozłowski, please. Yes, thanks a lot. Sorry that again, but it is so that uh, it's fruitful for us, I'm sure. Uh, I, that's, I'm sure <laughs> again that for me, that uh, um, I take the liberty to, to phrase it in old English and then ask you again. Uh, I've noticed in the internet that you were, let's say, uh, pretty active during the Yom Kippur War. And uh, now you had a lot of uh, activity on different, let's say, sides and levels, uh, uh, with uh, let's say really fascinating bi biography, if I can say so. Uh, and my question is, uh, uh, what do you think? What is your opinion in relation to these historical relations between Jews and Arabs and so on, and the situation nowadays? Uh, uh, at least I've got a feeling that what you've just you, what you just described, it is something like a famous Hobbesian war, everybody uh, against everybody, and in a sense maybe it is a bit more uh, obviously it's, uh, impossible to com compare wars, but uh, what I'm looking for at say and asking asking you is that maybe. The present situation, in in one sense at least, is a bit uh, uh, a bit more complicated. That it is something which is not, let's say, uh, exact war. Yes, it is going on in Gaza. But uh, what I let's say, I've got the feeling that what you just described. Sorry, that I am repeating it. It is just something that is uh, going, let's say, everywhere on every scale between uh, a lot of persons and so on and so on. Thank you. I, I'm not sure I got this question right, but uh, my, I think that first of all, Israel lives in a conflict since its uh, creation until now. And for us as citizens, I think, um, we at least I hold a complex view, okay? On the one hand, I want Israel to survive its I think for me, very crucial that we will, as Jews, after the Holocaust, we will have a state. And I'm ready to fight for it. I've been an intelligence officer. I fought in the Yom Kippur War. I do what I do for my country because I think it should exist. But then the question is, exist as what? You know, I don't want it just to exist. I want it to exist as a moral, democratic place. And I fight for that as well. So... Sometimes I'm, you know, serving the state. I also serve the state in my role. I've always been in public service, never went to the private one. So I'm sort of a public servant. And on the other hand, I am, I resist within the system. And that's for me, the only position I can take because I can't, I emotionally, I can't go against Israel. It's my country and I think it should exist. And I think it, something like the 7th of October should not happen and we should have a strong army to protect ourselves because it's a very difficult neighborhood. But I think we should not be deluding ourselves that power on its own will solve the problem. Well, even Hobbes realized that at the end, you know, you need a social contract. So um, unless you want to fight forever. So uh, I'm not a Hobbesian, but uh, we reached the same conclusion. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so uh, if anybody wants to ask a question or have a comment, I think that's the last available moment. All right, so we... Okay, Algird. 
Thank you. The question I am considering in my mind was as you ask about Polish experience. Have you got any particular question, something in mind we might support you? I want to know how you did it, how you managed to get a, a change of government, because we're trying for years. Ah, okay. Uh, be, uh, because the political uh, situation has been deteriorating, and we always thought the Israeli democracy is strong, but it's now... Um, okay, uh, but... But my question is, are we talking about 1989 or uh, the previous year? No, so, I'm uh, talking about the, the last uh, round of elections that ma you managed to, if I understand it right, to change the government. Okay, it is a very open question. I think there's a lot of authorities who can say things wiser and better than me. But in my opinion, the absolutely crucial part was the woman's voice. As the researchers make, that if there are only uh, male citizens who vote, the, our uh, right with a uh, police party would stay. And the women's, especially activists, change it. But it is only my opinion that it is some kind of summarizing. And I would love to leave the floor for others' uh, specific opinions and researches. If that is true, this is really fantastic. <laughs> May I say a couple of words, something? Yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, I would like to answer this question. Uh, the problem is uh, that the democratic camp uh, won elections in Poland also using polarization as a weapon. But polarization in this regard create a strong uh, mobilization, especially among younger uh, voters and, and women. Uh, but still it was based on, on anger, on disapproval. The question is, how deep could be this reaction as the fundament of democracy or democratic uh, agree, uh, governing? That's not enough. Uh, to win election is one thing, and to change the mood in our country is a completely di different thing. And I, I fully agree when you say we have to present our disagreement. We, have, we need to have a voice, also as universities, also as intellectual, uh, intellectuals. But the major problem is... Uh, and uh, we feel it also that political polarization is coming to us and dividing us using uh, political radicalism and uh, words uh, who simply disqualified opponents. And there is no chance for dialogue. And if there is no dialogue, there is no uh, a solution, a real solution of any, any problem. So I think that uh, 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 school is very important, not only uh, because uh, another alternative voice is coming towards government, and I do believe that we have the same uh, attitude regarding this democratic government, and not only this uh, autocratic government we, 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 we are not under now. But the problem is that if we would like to uh, be honest, we should first of all create the environment in which there are reason and emotions, but environment in which people are together, are really together. So they are integrated because polarization disintegrate. And the school is not only one solution. We do a lot of, uh, 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 with some, some participants of the seminar, we do a lot discussing in Poland to what uh, to what degree uh, social energy is, is needed as the basis. Social energy, energy means for us the uh, autonomous action, autonomous initiative, social initiative, and also means that people uh, create a community in which they create common goods. And among those common goods are also values, different values. And without uh, 
this environment who is really alternative to polarization and disintegration and strong, very strong emotions. There are the sentiments, not heart. There is a lot of hatred in this. We will not, even we will win elections, we will not change the situation. I, I so much agree with you. I think that also here, demonstrations were based on anger and despising Bibi. But despising Bibi, as I said, negativity is not a plan. Negativity may be a motivation, but not a plan. And unfortunately, we don't have a positive plan. Okay. All right. I think uh, mm, I would like to mm, say that I don't think many of my many of uh, uh, Polish people would agree with that. But I think that the polarization that we had here was not all that very strong compared to the U.S., for instance, because the religious elements and and israel because the religious element catholicism is paradoxically not very strong in poland <laughs> up to some point we're a catholic country but it's a pragmatic catholicism you know the people's catholicism when you can at the one hand go to the church but at the other be perfectly aware that for instance, the priest isn't the best person around, you know? And so the Catholicism is not very motivating. And I, I think uh, the political parties try to do the motivating, but they are not yet, as in the US, in a situation when they can uh, say, vote for us because if you vote for us, we'll, uh, you know, how to say it, we'll be able to want in some way the other side, the other people that you hate. You know, it's not like that. Vote for us, so we'll, we'll show them. It's rather like vote for us, so we'll give you something, you know, it's more contractual. So I, I think... Um, but then there was a lot of anger because of the abortion uh, law is terror. So that was, I think, the main issue that mobilized so many people. Okay, uh, so we do not have more comments, I think. All right, so <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Professor. Thank you very thank much. You. It was it was fascinating because it's really a, 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 the situation you were speaking about. We experience it every day from afar. and But I don't think many of us had uh, a possibility to listen to someone who's, who's, you know, in there. And so, and I think it's also, it's interesting that we have so many things in common when it comes to, you know, polarization, populist power. And I think also the, the question of, uh, for me, the, the people that come here to Poland uh, and their children in a system and their, and we don't know what to do with them. Maybe we should look at other uh, countries and their experiences with it. All right, so thank you again. Thank you very much, and um, let's continue the conversation. And I don't think we're going to solve anything soon, so we will have probably more yeah. opportunities to discuss it.